This is uh, the penultimate session of the conference. My name again is Katerina Storing, and I have the great pleasure to moderate this session on um, the future agenda for research and policy. Now, we started off yesterday by discussing the way in which the power structures that shape the global political economy also shapes the global health landscape and the growing power of corporations and private finance at the expense of, often at the expense of civil society and citizen engagement. We've heard uh, that market moralities are extremely prevalent in national level moves towards universal health coverage, often involving state subsidization of private sector uh, expansion of healthcare and regressive private health insurance. Um, we've also discussed a lot how language matters and how terms like the private sector and even insurance has become a gloss for many different things. We've been alerted to the double meaning of terms like investing in health and also been um, alerted to the terrible, uh, terrifying future envisaged by this logic driving the financialization of health that Susan spoke about earlier, the private, uh, third wave of privatization. And I think the, the cross-cutting theme that we've been discussing is that this is all about power. So now we've learned how to analyze it and we know what it is. And the question now is, uh, what do we do about it? How do we redistribute power? And what is the future agenda for research and policy and not least politics? So we had invited politicians and policymakers from Norwegian government to come from the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of International Development, but they declined although they'll all be at the global financing facility on Monday and Tuesday. Um, so uh, this means that whatever change is going to come out of this has to come from the people in this room, which is great. And so uh, to discuss this future agenda, we have a very uh, great panel here. I want to introduce uh, Shea Abimbola, who is a, a doctor from Nigeria who has also completed a PhD in health systems research, focusing on the role of governance uh, uh, in the adoption and scale up of health systems innovations. And uh, in addition to being a lecturer uh, at the University of Sydney and uh, associated with the University of Oxford, one of the main reasons that we invited him today is because he is the editor in chief of uh, BMJ Global Health. Um, Tammy Boyce uh, is project manager of the Footprint Initiative, examining the economic and social impact of health systems at WHO European Office for Investing uh, for Health and Development. She has over 15 years experience in research and policy concerning health inequalities, public health, participation, vaccination, sustainability, and communication. Um, Salima Namizobaya, is a lawyer and human rights advocate who has specialized in international human rights law and forced migration. She's currently executive director of the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights and an expert member of the Working Group on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights of the African Commission on uh, Human and People's Rights. Now, um, you'll see in the program that Ilona Kickbush from the Graduate Institute in Geneva was supposed to be on the panel. She was meant to be commenting on, on multi-stakeholder initiatives. Uh, including UHC 2030, of which she's co-chair, but unfortunately um, she was prevented from coming. We decided that we needed two men to replace her. <laughs> so we're very grateful uh, to Jomo and to David, who have accepted to join us at very short notice. <laughs> uh, Jomo, I was wondering if you can uh, comment uh, from your vantage point in Malaysia, what, what uh, potential do you see for governments of the global south to contribute to a redistribution of power at the global level of governance that we've been discussing? Well, part of the problem, I think, is that uh, many governments uh, in the south, um, um, different, govern different line ministries, ministers, uh, do not are not well connected, but with the economic ministries, and I'm speaking here of the finance ministry and the trade ministry in particular. So it is often the finance ministry which determines the budget, as you know, and it is the trade ministry which determines um, the international commitments and constraints and shackles uh, which which uh, health policy operates in. So it's extremely important for one to take this kind of all-of-government approach which was being advocated mm -hmm. earlier. Only by doing so can we have the, the needed um, weight of the line ministries, in a sense, uh, coming together, forming strong coalitions 
to push their various interests against the ostensible superior, superior economic logic and, and rationality of the economic ministries. I think this is very important. But this is also important, in my mind, for those who are working in international agencies to begin to think about how to, where, where there is room for movement. One of the difficulties of the, the two presentations, excellent pre presentations on power we heard earlier, um, is how do we begin to think about the daily, day-to-day -day struggles which most of us are involved in where we work. We often work in governance, and if you, as I think Jasudra yesterday mentioned, you know, if you if you see if you see every the state as the enemy, international agencies as the enemy, everybody is the enemy. You're not going to have many friends. So you all, with, despite all the rhetoric of speaking on behalf of the people and so on, you're pretty isolated. But what you really need to do is to build coalitions. And I think what Ikegami Sensei said earlier is extremely important. You always don't you don't want to get stuck in a situation. So it's not going to be easy in many societies to make a transition where primary health care providers, the first port of call, are going to be rewarded more highly than specialist doctors. That transition is not going to be easy to come about. But if you have a system of rewards which is constantly subject to revision, and, and you, are all, you always recognize the need to have support, which whatever revision you make, you don't want the majority of the people you're working with against you, then you, you have a more, li uh, a more viable strategy for reform. And so I take very seriously his advice about how to go about doing reforms. Because one of the big problems we have is that we are all stuck with systems which we have inherited. Mm. How do we move from those systems which we have inherited to the systems which we consider to be more desirable? These are not things which are going to be achieved overnight. Mm. And, and short of the kind, you know, even if you have a revolutionary transformation, you can be sure that people won't, won't know how best to, 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 to build a new system, mm. uh, you know, overnight. So you, you need to, be, to, be, to have a room for learning. And this is where I think modesty and a, 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 a constant sense that in everything you, you're trying to do, you need to unite the many to defeat the few. Mm. And let's face it, the neoliberal project was essentially the few. Mm. And this is why Trump and others like him have been so successful in defeating the rest of the right. Yeah. The, new, the, the, the globalist neoliberal right is actually an uh, elite project. And this is part of the, 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 the project, the problem. So if you begin to recognize the fragility and the tenuousness of the power which these these people have, then I think we are in the business of bringing about the reforms. Mm -hmm. But there is no universal formula about mm -hmm. what to do and how mm -hmm. to do so. Mm -hmm. I think it will have to be determined very much by people who are engaged in particular struggles, in particular contexts. Maybe even calling it a struggle, you know, is exact. This is going to turn off some people. Call it, you know, reforms. I mean, improvements. <laughs> you know, call it something bland if if you need to. As long as people know what you, what, you know, can 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 agree on what what is being desired. Now, the main argument I think we have at this point for state financed reforms is precisely the recognition that the a growing recognition in the OECD countries. <clears throat> that health insurance is an inferior way of going about it in terms of cost effectiveness and so on. So we, what we need to do is to, is, to, is to make the economic argument as well as every other argument. And it, this will be a very conventional kind of argument which many of you might not feel very comfortable being associated with, <laughs> but it is an argument because you are it, introducing an unnecessary layer of bureaucracy, administration, and costs by insisting on an insurance type structure where you break down social solidarity, you break down all the various things which we, we deem to be desirable. So I think thinking about how to do that, where we work, in our own governments, and also wherever else we try to bring about changes, I think is the biggest challenge which we face. Hmm.
Thank you very much. I want to pick up on what you said um, um, about mobilizing the many to defeat the few and ask um, Tammy to comment a little bit about what you see as the potential for community and individual engagement and future policy on universal health coverage. Um, I will, but I'm going to respond to Jomo first because mm -hmm. I wasn't, I suppose what I want to say is the, the project I'm working on right now for the WHO is for the European office. Mm -hmm. And about two weeks ago, in the way these big organizations work, I learned that, that the WHO office in Geneva is doing a very similar project to what we're doing, but we did, neither one of us knew that the other existed. <laughs> and what we're doing is providing exactly what you've just called for, which is it sounds slightly boring and not very whoop whoop exciting, but providing economic evidence using input output tables, which are available for every country, about the impact of health systems. And helping countries, what we hope to do by this time next year or earlier than that, is to have a website so each country can go in there and come up with an economic argument using economic uh, evidence that's available. It should be available in each country because we're doing it in a couple of countries in. Europe and the Geneva offices using a couple of countries in Africa. Um, so hopefully we can then give people that evidence because I think you're right. For me, what, uh, what has struck me repeatedly is language. Um, but I also, um, I think David has said a few things that I, I wanted to pick up on and about the difference between politics and policy. And also I was thinking about what you said yesterday and I suppose if I want to be slightly provocative and work every, wake everyone up as we approach Friday, late Friday afternoon, I, I think some of what you say, David, I find it very frustrating as someone who has been an academic and who has worked in policy circles. Because for me, the reality is I don't really know where I can draw the line between what is a policy, what is policy and what is politics. It all kind of depends on the meeting I'm in and which minister I'm meeting with or which group of people from which ministry and, and, and that changes the question. So some of the debate we've had today and yesterday has been very academic. And that would be my request going further is that yes, you need those academic debates, but you need them to also be explained so they make sense to everyone else. I think the discussion on power was interesting, but I was left thinking as an activist, I'm not really sure if I, I need those definitions of power like that. They make sense to me, but I needed to know what was the point of what was, mm -hmm. why I was doing it. And I think that's where this group can really help us make sense of taking those theories and not so much just giving us the theories, but making us in our language. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm a former academic <laughs> for my sins, but t helping me make sense of it. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, that would be my plea moving forward. But if I think about communities and individuals and how this all makes sense. And I was really, as I said, thankful that you said, it's often regarded as a panacea, let's just add the public and then everything will be okay. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to say, I've written a report about it, which I am not that happy about, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you, you get asked to write reports and you're not quite sure what they are at the beginning and then at the end you think, did I write that? But you know, these things happen. <laughs> um, yeah, some people who laughed have all done this, I think. Um, so I think, um, we need to show more, not so much, again, I would say to the, the, the commission as you move forward, is not so much what the problems are, and we get asked this as, at WHO constantly, stop telling us what the problems are and help us find the solutions. And I would throw that back to you, that it's, it's, we need ways to know where to engage, where the public should be engaging, where they have engaged, and where there have been some wins, big wins, small wins, local wins, national wins all of those things we need to know. And we really, like, please move out of Europe and North America and Australia. That's, that would be another comment I would say, is this is a global conference, but it doesn't feel that global to me right now. It still feels a fairly European um, conference or a gl definitely a Global North conference. Um, but I was also struck that these issues are complex and, you know, Judith and Sanya and, Anna and Susan and Sakiko and um, the other Susan and Deborah and I was left with those conversations about trade and access overwhelmed with detail. And so how do we engage citizens in that and civil society in those things, in those issues that are so complex that it's hard for me with a PhD to sit here and think, what in the world can I do? So it really needs to be unpicked. And I think there should be a global movement. I mean, I feel, I felt part of an immoral 
culture after listening to Susan speak, and how could I change that? But I just felt as if I'd hit a speed bump and I didn't know what to do. So it's part of the commission's role, I think, to help us make sense of that, to give citizens the language to do that. And that's mainly what I think the role of academics are. Um, I think journals are of limited use. Journal articles are of limited use. I think I'd love to see a nice <laughs> website that the commission does. I think, what if, the web, what if you took your evidence and each article you did and made it 300 words in a blog or made some infographics about it? That's what I would encourage you to do going forward. Yes, journal articles are useful. Of course they are. And they're really useful for organizations like the WHO. I'm constantly looking for better evidence. <laughs> um, and I'm glad everyone challenged James about, you know, are we the leaders or what is the role of, of all of us sitting here in civil society? And I felt really optimistic after everyone said, of course we have a role in this. And maybe you were being provocative as well, but I was wondering why the anthropologists didn't quote Margaret Mead, who said the famous, you know, never think a small group of people can change the world because they're the only ones who ever did. Um, I hope you'll indulge me to say one more thing, um, which I think is, um, I wanted to just bring up a few things about the Gates Foundation and also about who's defining where we're going forward next because I felt as if in all of the, I didn't really have an opinion on Gates before I came here, um, <laughs> but if I just listened to what I heard in two days, I think they were terrible. But I really missed what people who are working for in these countries for organizations like this, what they think of these organizations. And I think it's worth thinking is Gates to be as vilified? They provide a lot, these organizations provide jobs, which provide income in these communities, which, you know, those incomes improve these countries. I mean, I just think it's a very <laughs> easy target. And if Gates wasn't there, where would that money be? Would there be any money? Would these projects be there? So I would ask if there are conversations about Gates in the future and, and such similar organizations that we hear a little bit more from the Global South. And I think. Salima asked a question yesterday about who decides what a, pro a country's priorities are. And I think, who's deciding, for this group, who's deciding what your research priorities are? And I would like it to, to I think, going forward, be a little bit more inclusive of the global academic world and the global citizen world in the future. Well, thank you for those comments. I think maybe the next conference will have to be about uh, whether vilifying the Gates Foundation is justifiable, but we're not going to be able to take that debate right now. But um, I, I want to pick up on what you said about, about providing uh, more practical lessons about what we can do. And I am hopeful that Salima can tell us a little bit, based on your experience as a human rights um, lawyer, how human rights law can uh, serve as a tool for addressing inequity in global and national policies. OK, um, thank you. First of all, I want to emphasize the point that was made yesterday and uh, that is being made by Tami today. I sat here like the past two days and I was impressed at the level of research, the information that is here. And I kept asking myself, oh, you know, I wish the people at the national level had this information because in many cases we are engaged in advocacy, but people have no clue how things connect with each other. Many times we are advocating with a state and you think that the state has all the power to change mm. what is happening within the country, but yet there's all these uh, other players at the global level that many actors at the national level do not have. So like emphasizing that we need, as I think it's Rosalind who said yesterday, to connect the grassroots with mm -hmm. the global and building mm -hmm. those, no, uh, those networks will really be useful um, in terms of moving us forward. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the agenda would be how do we get um, national level people mm -hmm. to access the research mm -hmm. and understand what is going on and how mm -hmm. it impacts um, mm -hmm. what is happening at the national level, why we are not progressing with UHC. But um, also from yesterday, again, it was clear that um, a lot of what we are discussing has to do with power, the power mm -hmm. that people have either as donors or um, as investors or as NGOs to impact on uh, the lives of people generally. and. Um, the discussion I, I think that has missed is 
what we can do practically, for example, from a human, if you, from a human rights perspective, which is what um, I would want to speak to briefly. Um, first of all, just the fact that human rights articulates the right to health is uh, very useful in terms of uh, having it as something that can be enforceable, that people can claim as an entitlement, that people can say, I have a right to health. If you're not covering me, mm -hmm. you're violating the right to health. I think um, it's already an important contribution that um, human rights law um, makes. But also, um, the right to health can, it creates obligations for states mm -hmm. to respect, protect, fulfill. And um, in implementing the, the various obligations, the, the states will be pushed to um, be able to, for some states it will be slowly, um, try to move towards uh, achieving UHC. But we've seen that, for example, some treaty bodies like the uh, Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights have said that, you know, just expanding coverage for health without, um, when it excludes, for example, poor and marginalized communities mm. is not enough from a human rights perspective. So states have to take care that as they are expanding um, health care, they have to include um, the marginalized populations that um, are being left behind at the moment. But also we've seen some countries being pushed. Um, for example, um, we saw um, Canada mm. being pushed by the Human Rights Committee um, where they, uh, they had a decision um, in one of the cases, uh, they, there is a case of Nail to Sant against Canada, where the Human Rights Committee said that the fact that this individual, Nail, was denied um, access to health care simply because they were an irregular immigrant mm. um, was a violation of the right to health and was a it was discriminatory and it's against the right to life. So um, m making use of these tools that, um, that human rights presents um, is important. But also when you look at the global power, there is a, a concept of extraterritorial obligations mm. of states that um, is now being emphasized more within the human rights circles that would be useful uh, for us to use in terms of checking power that, um, for example, global actors, be it states or uh, non-state institutions have. And again, we've seen um, this play out, for example, when there was a review of, again, it's Canada by the um, human rights, um, by the CEDAW committee, uh, mm -hmm. Committee on Elimination of All Forms Against Women, and also the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Canada was being pushed. Yesterday, people were discussing um, about the trade and investment agreements. Mm -hmm. And Canada was uh, being told by the committee mm -hmm. that they have to take responsibility for what their mining companies are doing abroad mm -hmm. and make sure that they provide adequate regulation to prevent the harm that these companies may be doing abroad. But also, um, this was for Canada and uh, also Switzerland when they were being questioned about uh, the trade and investment agreements that they are entering into mm -hmm. and the fact that this may be harmful. So even where these agreements exist, you can use the human rights angle to kind of check, much as the countries may have entered um, into these agreements. Yesterday I was sharing that countries like Uganda entered into some of these trade and investment agreements prior, for example, to TRIPS+. Plus. So much as these um, waivers were given under TRIPS, we were already bound by some of the agreements that came prior. So um, it becomes difficult because um, the, 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 the other investors can still enforce if you go against the agreement, much as uh, TRIPS exists. But um, having these interactions with human rights committees would be uh, useful in that sense. And uh, for purposes of time, maybe I'll just talk about the accountability mechanisms that um, human rights uh, provides, both at the national level and at the international level. Uh, from the national level, of course, we do have uh, things like courts, we do have uh, administrative bodies, human rights institutions that would be used to check um, the inequities that do exist in health. And we've seen some cases um, globally that have been helpful at the national level. Mm -hmm. For example, many people may be uh, conversant with the South African case of treatment action campaign mm -hmm. that expanded the access to care for uh, HIV patients. And these are beginning to become very many across the 
the globe. But um, at the regional and international level, of course, there is that mechanism of state reporting um, where the states are reviewed by different treaty bodies uh, to kind of speak to the progress that they've made about, uh, regarding implementation of human rights under the treaty that the committee is concerned with. So this is a good avenue for uh, asking critical questions. But also um, there are uh, other avenues like um, special rapporteurs. There are uh, avenues like uh, individual communications where people can take cases that are useful. And lastly, to mention that human rights is also developing in terms of recognizing the responsibilities of non-state actors. Mm. And we see that there is a growing move to push for, for example, a binding treaty um, on, on corporate accountability mm. that would make actors like, uh, you know, uh, the corporations, players like uh, the Gates Foundation more accountable mm. for, the, uh, for their actions that are keeping us behind in terms of UHC. I could add on um, later if mm -hmm. time allows. Thank, Thank you, you very much for raising those issues. And I think it's particularly interesting to think about those uh, uh, transnational uh, and, and non-state actor applications of human rights uh, frameworks as we go forward. But you, um, like Tammy, you also talked about the <coughs> knowledge really and translation of, of uh, scientific evidence into practical lessons and, and dissemination of knowledge. And so I want to uh, move now to Shea, who, as I said, is editor-in-chief um, of Global Public Health. Um, what do you see really as um, the role of a journal like yours and of the academic community as we move forward? And what are the research priorities um, that we should be pursuing, and to what extent can you, as a as an editor of a of a journal coming out of a medical tradition, integrate a focus on, on what we're calling the political origins or the political determinants of health into your editorial line? Thank you. So, so I will, I will answer your question by by reflecting a bit on what um, I've observed since yesterday, mm -hmm. but also then talking about my experience at the journal, um, and I'll perhaps start by saying that. One of the things that have struck me in my three or so years um, in the role is how inconsequential a, a lot of the research we receive is. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I say that because there's a, there's a tradition in, in medicine, in epidemiology, in economics, that sort of puts a lot of value on what is often described as rigorous evidence. And that kind of evidence you can generate by essentially studying intervention. And, and you do either big trials or you run fine regressions and you come up with really nice numbers and, and they look really good and neat on paper and, and they are very well rewarded in, in the research tradition. Um, but when you look at what those interventions are, or the questions that those methods are trying to answer, um, to use the word I used earlier again, they are largely inconsequential. Right? They, they shift the dial a little bit. They improve the lives of a few people a little bit. Um, they work within, they often function within the predominant system. In other words, they don't do what they say is to sort of challenge the system or transform the system or reform the system. They, they are sort of traditional. And I think that there's a, um, it, it, this kind of evidence provides a lot of space for, for, um, for NGOs, for the private sector, um, who works in the logic of intervention. And unfortunately as well, um, I'm very much aware that they also then in many ways pervert that evidence generation process in, in many places. I, I can't name names or name institutions, but there, there's a lot going on. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, unethical uh, research or unethical practices, primarily because of the, of the kind of evidence that we have prioritized um, in, 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 in the academic community um, and that make us feel good uh, but don't change much. So, so that's the first thing I wanted to mention. That, that the sort of work that I've listened to people present here hardly make their ways into the big global health journal. 
And when they do, they make their way into those journals as commentaries, as letters, <laughs> but never as research. Yeah. Um, I, and I think that is broadly problematic and something we need to challenge. Um, and not say that Lancet is guilty here, although it is. Um, <laughs> I, but my next point um, was going to be that I've noticed as well that, that people haven't challenged the power of the Lancet to convene commissions. And we talked about power a lot in this, in this meeting since yesterday, and that has essentially escaped that sort of repeated attack on power. And, and I think it's worth, it's, it's worth talking about. What gives the Lancet, what gives the University of Oslo the legitimacy to, to convene such a panel? And, and by virtue of they being the people to convene it, who is, whose voices are not heard? Um, who, who is left out, what agenda are left out. And, and David did a bit of just showing us the kinds of things that get lost mm. when we have these kinds of hegemonies um, at play and structuring and framing um, 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 the, the agenda. Uh, and, and it's worth thinking about and, and asking ourselves um, those important questions. Now, the third thing I'll mention, and I'll stop after the third thing, is, is that the... Part of what leads to a situation in which journals are so powerful that researchers then tend to write the sort of things that journals would like um, uh, is, is something that I wish that we, we challenge um, head, head on. I, I run a journal, and, and journals are not immune. The, the journals are vulnerable, and, and they, they will respond, they respond to challenge. And it's worth challenging. Um, the, the sort of work on, on, on trade, um, on, on power, on politics, etc., should be the mainstream of what a global health journal publishes. It should be at the center of what we do. But it's not. And, and we can't, if we want to change moving forward, we can't continue to acquiesce to what the journals prefer. Our, our role is to challenge the practices of the journal and the practices of the academic establishment that makes those kinds of research that are, again, inconsequential, the sort of things that people tend to gravitate towards doing. Thank you very much. You'll be receiving a lot of submissions next week. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I just want to pick up on, on um, something related to that, which is the role of universities. Now, yesterday, Ulthusen uh, suggested to us that universities are part of the solution to this problem through education. And uh, that, you know, by training the next generation, things will get better. And the immediate reaction on Twitter, at least, was that this is untenable, especially in the context of uh, planetary health, of the challenges of climate change, et cetera, that we cannot afford to wait for the next generation. And then you could argue that universities still provide a, a locus for, for transformative change. But what about um, the fact that many of the leading public health institutions, educational institutions, um, today are um, entirely imbricated in the institutional power dynamics that we've been discussing, whether it's through um, funding from uh, private or philanthropic uh, sources or through dependency on other non-state actors for research access. I was just wondering if anyone in the panel would like to comment on that. Can I just quickly mm -hmm. um, say a couple of words about that? Uh, th th there are lots of complaints um, about institutional practices in research, um, big research institutions, universities, global health institutes, um, that, that we don't get, we can't publish because they are just libelous. I mean, to publish them is to invite lawsuits, so we can't publish them. But as a journal editor, I can say to you that we receive a lot of complaints and issues that have gone through the hierarchy of institutes and universities that the university essentially shuts down. And there's no other explanation for that than what you just said, that, that a lot of institutes and departments and universities are beholden to the, to the problematic structure that we've been talking about. Um, again, I don't have a solution to this, but, but I, I hope that by saying it out, and I doubt many editors will say these things out, but by saying it out, we can begin to talk about them openly, um, that there are that the, the, the edifices that look really shiny have a lot of 
things rotting underneath. Uh, and, and we need to find a way to expose those. Again, I don't know how to, but from my experience, from, from where I sit behind the curtain of, of academic publishing, these things are visible. But um, I want to open it up to some, some comments and questions from the audience. We'll start this slide and then do one, two, three, and then another round after. Yeah, thanks. And I suppose the stating whether it's a comment or a question rule that we had introduced earlier is a good idea. And please. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, it's a statement and a question, I suppose. And um, we are talking about uh, the responsibility and the role of academics of universities, but I, I would like to ask, to ask you about what you think about the role of the bureaucracy, about the public officials and all, because at least in Brazil, in the, our experience of healthcare reform, that was quite transformative in the 80s, uh, the public officials were very important together with, uh, you know, academics and connected to social movements, but social movements alone wouldn't be able to do that kind of uh, agenda and transformation. They, they were an import, important connection during the redemocratization process. And, and also about international relations between states, if the state nation is too important, what kind of realignment would be possible. In Brazil in the 2000s, we invested a lot, and Anne Manuel has just provoked me to, to comment on that. Uh, we invested a lot in South-South cooperation, in cooperation with other Latin American countries, with African countries, especially Portuguese-speaking African countries. And this was very important, and we called that uh, a structural cooperation. It was not just ponto aids, but to, to build capacities, mutual capacities like one example she gave was the, you know, the plant, the pharmaceutical plant, but lots of education and courses and mutual agreements on that. And so this was quite important. Our new president that someone has shown with his very new liberal <laughs> economy ministry, he thinks South South cooperation is, is secondary. You know, he thinks that we should learn from the North because you have so many to teachers and so <laughs> what do you think about this kind of international alignments and also public uh, okay. you know works. thank you and there was a comment at the back and james it's a statement uh so uh, my statement is about the line of whether a change can happen from a room like this whether this discussion can lead to a difference uh, and uh, I think it, uh, it does make a difference. It can make some difference. Uh, to share a story about this uh, quickly, Egypt uh, has passed a bill in the parliament uh, June 2018 this year um, about UHC. It's named Universal Health Insurance, not Universal Health Coverage, and went into action uh, into, in September this year uh, and is now going to be implemented in three governments. The history of this bill is enormous, like has been eight years on discussions, either before it get into the parliament or in the parliament, has been always um, pushed back, I wouldn't say denied, but pushed against. Um, and the main, one of the main things is the, uh, the financing, about the domestic financing, Ministry of Financing accepting. Now it is, and this is because the Ministry of Finance accepted it. But in 2015, uh, this minister, of, the now minister of finance, was in a room like this. He was the deputy minister of finance, and he was speaking about his, um, I wouldn't say anger, but uh, he was very pessimistic about the lack of support. Um, and in 2018, he got into office early this year, and he accepted it. Mm -hmm. And he accepted it because he understood from room like this how health is an investment, how financing health can actually get some more money into. Um, domestic resources, etc. So I think it can have some lights of hope, but not all of the picture. Thank you, James. We only have a, a few minutes left, so just uh, please be brief. Yeah. <laughs> 
just qu quickly a comment and a quick question, and I'm, I'm uh, just going to defend my earlier comment and clarify it, um, that I didn't say that we don't have a tremendous amount to do, but to always remember, I think everyone here would agree, the great advances in public health have come from social movements, have not come from the technocrats, have not come from academics. We play, a, I would argue, we play a huge role in supporting, identifying, recognizing, and supporting those movements. So just want to clarify that, that and I think this meeting is fabulous and really important and, and hope, hopefully directing us that direction. And I just wanted to say Shea's uh, discussion was just a fabulous way to have kind of a last word, I think, in this was really a, a, a kind of a truth telling about what's going on in the science of global health, because I work in institution. And I just, a qu quick question is, are there any ways that we can begin to shift and privilege African researchers who are going to af ask, I think, often different questions? It is so dominated by the Global North, the Global Health Research Enterprise. Do you have any ideas or strategies around how to begin to do that, given your position? Okay, um, there, is, there are lots of hands and five minutes. So this is uh, gonna be challenging, but let's uh, go from the back, yeah, here, thank you. Just be, please be brief. Thank you. Uh, just to let you know that the good news on trade investment agreements is if you want to start working on them, you don't have to start from scratch. There are a lot of social movements and CSOs already working on most of the trade and investment agreements, which have already been mentioned, including on the WTO, big networks in Africa, the Norwegian trade campaign here in Norway. So it would be great if anybody here, including academics, wanted to get involved. Uh, and I can put you in touch with the relevant CSOs in your country working on these agreements. So you don't have to do it all alone. There are existing movements out there who would love to have you. No, okay, please. Yeah. Oh. oh, Sorry, and then no, okay, and then we go back to the panel. I'll Thank be you. brief. <laughs> My question is about the role of the state, because we talked a lot about unregulated markets, but mm -hmm. the question I think is about unregulated by whom. Mm -hmm. uh, and for example, if we ask the Gates Foundation to raise awareness about political determinants of health, is that actually an appropriate role for a foundation, or is that something that states or other actors should be responsible for. Thank you. And then I'll end with. <laughs> um, just two brief comments. One, one is about uh, when you mentioned universities, you forgot to mention that medical schools are part of the university and they have a very strong biomedical reductionist approach. Mm -hmm. And all the medical textbooks are written either printed in U.S. or in, in the U.K. Mm. Mm. So um, that, that's something to be considered. The second, so that is why uh, it's, the, it's policy makers that must nudge doctors away from that biomedical model if there's going to be any change. The second comment is that we, we haven't mentioned anything about pension funds. Mm. And pension funds expect an interest on their investment. And it's not, the big finances have the power because they have the pension funds uh, behind them. And we, I'm a pensioner, so I expect to get more pensions than I contributed. And unless there's economic growth, that, that the pension funds won't be viable. So and that's a very important aspect that has not been mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Ruth, and then we take it back to the panel. Thanks. Go on, dear. I'll be brief, thank you. Um, it's a comment on the South-South cooperation and North-South cooperation, um, and the potential for, for these kinds of occasions to make networks and create coalitions. Um, at this occasion, we have several Af African academics who could not make it because of visa issues. Um, we should have had a delegation of health officials from Af some African countries who did not make it for visa issues. So how are we going to build these coalitions or these kinds of exchange when we, we actually don't have people like that here? So we should be having this, co this conference next time in, in an African country. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you. So um, as we are... Um, running out of time, I'm going to ask you each to provide some, um, some responses to these comments and questions, and we'll just start that end and go along the table. And thank you very much for all your contributions. Yeah, so um, the, the only question that was specifically directed at me um, from James, and um, so I've observed a few things that I think work um, in, in terms of building capacity for, of researchers in Africa and another um, part of the world. Um, that are not high-income countries. And, and, and one of those things that have worked is uh, dedicated funding 
for institutions over decades, right? So, and this doesn't align with how we often think about support and interventions, but these are things that won't give you any concrete results in five years. Perhaps in 15 years, you can start to see some PhDs and some locally driven research, you know, taking off and, and, and influencing policy. And I think, again, we, this community and the global health community, um, uh, whatever that is, needs to speak more and more um, up for those kinds of, of collaborations and support. And, and a good example is Kemri, where I'm trust in Kenya, um, and, and there are a few other examples um, on the continent um, uh, with Makerere and, and a few other places that, that have lasted decades and, and have built capacity within countries in, in a very, very strong way. Um, and, and I don't think, um, in, in terms of building those kinds of capacity, that, that, that for me is something that I've seen work, and I will hope that more and more of this kind of things would happen. And another initiative that I've been involved in um, uh, marginally has been to try to develop um, what is called good epidemiological practice in global health. So to have standards and, and norms that would guide research done by high-income country researchers in LMICs, which, which has a very strong capacity transfer and local initiative component. And I hope that takes off. Um, we're still developing the, the guidelines, but, but if, if that happens, um, I, I hope that it becomes the norm over time. And I also know of other initiatives, um, RFI, can't remember the full meaning, but it's been taken up a lot by Portuguese-speaking countries, Research Fairness Initiative, I think it's called, um, which again has very clear norms and guidelines for how to, to do research in LMICs in a way that transfers capacity. Over time. Thank you, Shane. Um, I'll just uh, respond a little bit to the role of civil servants and, and health professionals. I mean, they're just part of civil society in my world, so they're an, another voice to be heard. Um, but I think, uh, I think we should assume, as our colleague here from Japan has said, that they may not necessarily understand the social determinants of health or the political determinants of health. So there's a role in, in educating them, and also that is a role that the Lancet can play as well. And again, these are people too, so it's... The, uh, there's a way to, to, to use language to explain it to them. And I also, I, I just want to explain a little bit my comment about Gates because I think I've been slightly misunderstood. I simply wanted to hear a diverser group of people to speak about Gates than, than people from the global north. That was my call, is the next time we have this conversation, I'd rather have people from the countries where Gates is working, I'd rather hear their voices next time. One of the key uh, first, first on the question of state capacities, I, I think um, undoubtedly there has been a great deal of uneven development in the South. Uh, one of the major problems, of course, is the neglect of tropical diseases. And uh, fortunately for, for, for us in Malaysia, the mosquito cannot discriminate between the colonial and the colonized. And so uh, there was some public health uh, efforts uh, to, to no seriously. I mean these yeah. these are these are these are facts uh, of life, and and so you know, we had some degree of public health, and public health was taken quite seriously during that period. Um, and so there are other accidents of history which we need to take cognizance of, but also build on. But I think the question of state capacities is very very important because um, if you take for example even a poor country like Cuba you have a tremendous state capacities, and Cuba is doing a lot in terms of training doctors and so on and so forth. But uh, paramedics, uh, nurses and so on, health pro other health professionals is an area which is very, very much neglected. And we are seeing now, for example, in India, uh, uh, cardiac surgery is being performed uh, with highly, tr highly trained uh, para paramedics, uh, with not doing the operations themselves, but doing some of the support services. And so it is possible to reorganize uh, uh, medical procedures, surgical procedures, and so on and so forth in ways which are, which are much more effective. And it is precisely in the developing countries where many of these uh, reforms are taking place. Um, very quick. So I think the, the potential for South-South cooperation is especially important. And in the case of Brazil, you have a, a strong tradition where Brazil was the fastest growing. Most people don't even know Brazil was the fastest growing economy of the world in the world for half a century, from the 30s to the 80s, uh, to the 70s. Sorry, uh, you know, uh, for half a century it was the fastest growing economy, and 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 it developed, and a lot of it was due to state leadership. 
You might not like the military in power, but they did provide, and if you think about the most competitive so-called regional jet in the world today, it's Embraer, it's overtaken Bombardier, and, uh, you know, it was started off by the Brazilian Air Force. And, uh, you know, I mean, these are not things which we like to talk about, you know, but, but these are the facts of life. Now, if I may go on quickly to the role of individuals, I think it's also important to acknowledge. Uh, the, this is my second trip uh, abroad in, ab in about a year. And, uh, uh, but the first trip I made was to Bangladesh. And the main reason I wanted to go to Bangladesh was to meet Zafrullah Chowdhury. Most of you, except for some of those who have done uh, WHO history, don't know the name Zafrullah Chowdhury. He, he um, was practicing on Harley Street, gave up his practice, went and joined and provided the medical units uh, like Norman Bethune for the Bangladesh War of, Li of National Liberation. And uh, subsequently, he uh, uh, had a lot of influence in government, never became a minister or anything, but he was in influential in 74 and 77 when the list of 200 generic medicines was drawn up. Now, unfortunately, you know, this is 41 years later, that list is quite outdated. Most of those medicines are no longer in use. But there's never been an attempt to renew that list, you know. So there are things like this which have already been agreed internationally, which we do not make use of. And this back, leads us to the question of all the gains which have been made, compulsory licensing, thanks to Nelson Mandela's prestige after coming, to, uh, coming out of jail, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, the, all these gains we are not making sufficient use of. And part of the reason is limited capacities. And this is where South-South cooperation is important, but also North-South and triangular cooperation becomes extremely important in trying to move the, that uh, forward. I, I wanted to take uh, the opportunity to say something about WHO. You know, the, WHO is much maligned, but it's, it, it, is a, uh, it is probably one of the most difficult organizations to understand, because part of the, the uh, WHO is the only organization in the world in the UN system at least, where the regional heads are elected. And this, and part of the reason is because PAHO has existed for over half, a, uh, for over a century, okay? And PAHO has made its rules of its own and PAHO meetings are attended by the private sector. So much so that the rest of the WHO membership is so outraged that they insisted that the private sector cannot have a role in WHO proceed, proceedings, okay? Now this is a th something which is, I think, uh, you know, unusual because, for example, when I was in the FAO, the private sector was walking in all and, you know, walking through all the corridors all the time, you know. And, and so it does make a difference when you, if you know the institutional history, you, 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 you understand the strengths and the disadvantages it might confer and begin to, 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 uh, to, to work on that. Now, of course, it was used... Um, you know, partly, you know, uh, I mean, it, well, I, I better not get into all that. We need to wrap I, up. Yeah, I, I, I think um, uh, Sakiko brought, brought up the case of hepatitis C uh, um, uh, medicine yesterday. And she pointed out that I think the highest price is about 70000 Okay. Now, thanks to people like Sanya, who work very, very quietly, but pro helping governments to understand what they can do, Malaysia now has a deal with the Egyptian supplier to get a hepatitis C generic treatment, which costs slightly over $300, okay, compared to $70,000, okay, for a 12-week treatment. I mean, this is what the kinds of things we are talking about. Some of you may not remember that when, what's his name, um, that horrible <laughs> Martin Shkreli made a lot of money, yeah, that, that, you know, and Loretta Lynch tried to take him to to, to prosecute him, and there was nothing she could prosecute him for. Because under US law, price gouging is not a crime. You can price gouge as much as the market will allow you to. It's not a crime. And that's precisely what, what he, um, she, uh, so she had to uh, uh, t take him to court and convict him on, for running a Ponzi scheme. My last point, finance capital, <laughs> finance capital. Okay, uh, I think uh, Ikegami Sensei reminded us about the role of pension funds and how pension funds are, are, are very much part of finance capital. And the other thing is, of course, health insurance. How health insurance company, com, uh, com interest 
have basically defined the discussion for healthcare financing for us going forward. So middle, upper middle income countries are not talking about what OECD countries are talking about. They are talking about something which is more retrograde. And this is a, a huge problem. So we need to understand the, the, the powers which are influencing the discourses in our own societies. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're a little over time, so <laughs> your final thoughts. <laughs> okay, um, quickly about the role of civil servants. I think um, their role can be limited, especially in developing countries, because whoever brings the money determines the agenda. So you find civil servants who understand what it takes to achieve UHC, but they are frustrated because whoever has the money will come in and say, okay, I'm giving you money for training, but I'm training you about how to draft a PPP contract. And that is what you will be trained about. Or someone will bring money for HIV and say the approach will be abstinence, be faithful, use a condom. And yet, as a technical person, you know that uh, this is an approach that will not work. So there are limitations because of the fact that the money is coming from outside and um, it leads to lots of frustrations. Um, quickly about how to get African researchers to publish more. I've spoken, I have a number of friends who are in the academic circles and one of the things that they've raised is that um, many of the journals that they would want to publish with have high costs for publication. So many times they will have to look out for journals that are free or where they have some space for people who are publishing from developing countries and you know that's the only way they can be accommodated. So maybe part of the solution could be cut the fees. Then, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I want to thank all of the panelists for their contributions and also for ending this on a slightly more positive note than where we uh, um, started. Uh, I think you've uh, highlighted that there's probably not going to be a revolution anytime soon, but that there is room for maneuver for all kinds of different actors to change things in a, in a better direction. And I think until then, what is the role of our panel going to be? Well. I don't know, but maybe uh, one role is to, to heed the uh, unlikely lesson from Milton Friedman that Alex reminded of us earlier, that we need to keep the ideas alive until the unthinkable becomes inevitable. So um, thank you all very much. I'm going to hand over now to Sakiko, I think, for, uh, for the final session. Yeah. Thank you very much.